Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, this evening's installment of our Global Perspective Speaker Series. My name is Mark Wynn. I'm the Vice President here in the International Group at the Dallas Fed and the Director of the Bank's Globalization Institute, which organizes these events. This evening, we're breaking new ground with this series by hosting our first international event in conjunction with our El Paso branch. Special thanks to Roberto Coronado and the team in El Paso for their help in putting this event together. And also special thank thanks to the team in our San Antonio branch for their support on the logistics for this event. Our guest this evening is Alejandro Diaz de Leon, who currently serves as the governor of the Bank of Mexico, having been appointed to that position by the president of Mexico in December 2017. He is a career economist and has served in a variety of positions at the bank. His public service career has also included appointments at the Mexican Finance Ministry and Mexico's Export-Import Bank. He has been twice named Latin Finance's Central Bank Governor of the Year. The Dallas Fed has a very long-standing relationship with the Bank of Mexico that stretches back many decades. Indeed, the inaugural event in this speaker series featured Governor Diaz de Leon's predecessor, Augustine Carstens, who currently serves as the head of the Bank for International Settlements. Governor Diaz de Leon will participate in a moderated conversation with Rob Kaplan, who is the current president and CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before joining the Fed, Rob was a professor and a senior associate dean at Harvard Business School, which he joined after a long business career at Goldman Sachs. We will be taking audience questions during the event, and we'd love to hear from as, from as many of you as possible. If you'd like to ask the, quest, the speakers a question live, please uh, click the raise hand icon on the bottom of the control bar to enter the queue. If you would prefer to submit a written question, use the Q&A button on the bottom of the control bar to submit your question. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible and also try to address the questions in the order in which they're received. And we apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Rob. Rob? Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, Governor Diaz de Leon, thank you for being here. I'll call you Alejandro from here. Uh, I first met Alejandro in 2017 uh, when he first took over at the bank, uh, Banco de Mexico. And we've had a very close relationship. He's been a good friend. Uh, we regularly meet, uh, and in normal times, uh, usually we'll, we'll make a, a trip at least twice a year down to visit him. And uh, for those who don't know, Mark alluded to it. We did a joint board meeting today between uh, Alejandro's uh, senior executives and his board and our board at the El Paso Fed. We do this every year. Uh, and we think it's extremely important that we work closely uh, with the Bank of Mexico on research and talk regularly. Uh, and it's been very uh, instrumental in trade and other key issues uh, that affect the United States and the trading relationship between the United States and Mexico. So I feel very fortunate uh, to have had a great relationship with Augustine Carstens and now with, uh, with uh, uh, Governor Diaz de Leon. And so thank you for being here tonight. And we're, we're honored to have you here. You're on mute. That's a common, that's a common thing nowadays. Uh, very common. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the, to the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for this uh, opportunity and for the friendship. And uh, as you said, we had a very productive meeting uh, a few hours ago. And um, I think it is uh, fruitful for, for, for both institutions to deepen our understanding uh, and, and our shared fortunes, uh, to have more clarity about that is, is critical. And uh, it's an honor for me to, to participate in this uh, Global Perspective series uh, that you have, and, and also thanks to, to Mark too. So uh, let, let me just start, as we get started here, uh, there's a long history and pretty illustrious history of uh, senior executives in the, in the Bank of Mexico being educated in the United States, having very close relationships with the economics community here. You might talk a little bit about your background in going into economics uh, and how you chose public service. Happy to do so. Well, first, uh, I started uh, studying economics in 91. Uh, I think uh, in part, in a large part, because of the crisis in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, being a, 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 a young individual and just looking at how chaotic uh, the economic conditions were in the 70s and in the 80s. 
it was really very uh, important uh, and I had a lot of curiosity uh, uh, why we had such a high inflation, why the economy was in such disarray. And that's why I, I uh, was very interested uh, in learning about economics. And uh, I started work, uh, studying at ITAM, which is a, a university here in Mexico City. And a professor of uh, advanced macro uh, once told me, well, uh, I have a telephone here. Uh, it's a guy that works at the Banco de Mexico. Just give him a call. I don't know what, what can happen. And uh, it was Agustin Carson's uh, telephone, actually. So I called him uh, in 91. And after that, I started working at uh, the central bank uh, in 91. Uh, uh, and that was, uh, uh, I was finishing my, my studies. And um, I started obviously learning in a very, uh, in, a, in a great place to learn about economics here at the central bank. And, and the central bank has had for at least four decades, a long history of having a good scholarship program to basically send people abroad and to study uh, in the best universities uh, that uh, both in the US and in Europe. And uh, I was fortunate enough to also be part of that, of that program. And that's how I um, managed to uh, start my career here at the Central Bank and also study uh, abroad uh, uh, at Yale University. And then came back uh, at the Central Bank and also uh, continued my, my, my work uh, here at the Central Bank. So uh, I'll mention one other thing, and then we're going to dive right into the, the economy. But one of the other unusual things I've noticed over the years about, about your bank is, uh, is the fact that many of you have spent time in other parts of the government. Uh, I know you spend time at the Ministry of Finance. You've spent time in other parts of the government in the pension area. Uh, that's a little more unusual uh, among Fed people in the United States. Talk a little bit about uh, what the tr tradition is of moving in other parts of the, of the government in Mexico. Yes, uh, as you highlight, uh, it is very common to, to work here at the Central Bank and be literal and spend a couple of years uh, with a particular agenda and a particular responsibility and then uh, come back to the Central Bank. So um, that has been, I think, very important and uh, we have had even uh, presidents of the country that uh, were central bankers that spent here a lot of years, Ernesto Cedillo, and then he went uh, to different areas of responsibility and he ended up being uh, Mexico's president. So I, I think there is a, a very uh, long tradition of trying to uh, and promote this uh, rotation uh, from public service. And, and I think it's uh, mutually beneficial. I think, um, the, the people that are trained in their early stages at the central bank have much to give in other public uh, service uh, places. And when they come back, uh, when they do uh, come back to the central bank, uh, I think they also have a, a broader perspective on, on, on things. So you became governor, uh, and I remember well in 2017, um, we had a new president in the United States at the time. And, and uh, there, there already were uh, trade tensions and also a lot of currency volatility in Mexico. And you, you started with a whole range of challenges. I wonder if you could talk about that and what your biggest challenges were uh, during those early years when you first took over. Yes, happy to do so. Uh, when, when I uh, came back to the central bank uh, in 2017, uh, basically, uh, we were already in the midst of a, of a challenging times because we had, you remember in 2016, uh, the Saudis decided that they don't want it to be uh, uh, the, 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 the ones to adjust supply to keep prices up. So we had a very sharp contraction in oil prices that started sending a significant shock into the fiscal accounts, also the external accounts. Actually, we ended up shifting from being an oil export economy to now be an oil import economy. Uh, so dramatic changes in the external accounts uh, that were actually aggravated by, let's say, the, the concerns or the uncertainty regarding NAFTA. And uh, clearly, uh, as the US presidential unfold and uh, uh, NAFTA was part of, uh, of, the, of the driving narrative of the, of the election and of the first uh, actions uh, in office of uh, President Trump, uh, well, that was uh, clearly a factor that increased uncertainty about the external accounts in Mexico, on top of the challenge that we were already facing with uh, the oil, uh, the, the reduction in oil prices. So these were uh, really challenging times, as you uh, said, 
um, the exchange rate needed to adjust and was already uh, adjusting. And this created also uh, a challenging times uh, for the fiscal accounts that increased local gasoline prices, which actually fueled, uh, fueled uh, an increase in inflation. So we were literally uh, in a tightening uh, cycle. We needed to increase rates uh, at a more, more or less rapid fashion because we were facing significant inflationary pressures coming from different sources uh, and in a time of, uh, of acute uncertainty. So it may surprise people to hear, but you might just share with them, what was the inflation rate in 2017 and where was your equivalent of the Fed funds rate? Well, uh, we were uh, around 3.5 before all of this started to materialize. We were around uh, 3.5 range. And then we ended up above, above uh, 6% inflation. Inflation, yeah. And then, and then uh, we needed uh, to, to obviously take, uh, take measures to bring inflation down. And uh, so challenging times, obviously, uh, we, we were also uh, facing uh, a domestic uh, election towards 2018. So there was also, uh, let's say, idiosyncratic elements of uncertainty uh, in, those, in, 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 those, in those months. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we had inflation uh, coming back down. Uh, it, it was very close to target, uh, very close to 3% uh, December last year. But then we had uh, another round of shocks now coming with the pandemic, but I'm sure we'll go into that a little later. Um, you might comment something we don't have to worry about much as a central banker, I don't have to worry about in the United States, is currency outflows and fear of foreigners, you know, uh, very quickly pulling money out. You might just talk about, I know you had to be very concerned uh, with foreign investment, uh, people being willing to be in the peso, you might just talk about that and explain that. Sure. Um, I would say that emerging markets in general, uh, we tend to be uh, capital import economies. We don't have, to have sufficient savings and we, we, we need to, to import capital from abroad. So, so that is why uh, Mexico for a very long period of time, we have been uh, basically opening, not only in terms of trade, but also in terms of financial flows. Uh, we have opened our exchange rate market. We have opened our uh, debt securities market. And we have, uh, I would say, uh, attained the second most liquid cur currency in the emerging market space behind the renminbi. And 80% uh, of all of the peso uh, dollar uh, flows are done uh, with non-residents. Uh, so it's really a global currency. And uh, that obviously has enormous uh, advantages, but also challenges. Uh, it has been very helpful to uh, absorb uh, shocks, either from uh, abroad or homegrown. And uh, having a floating exchange rate has uh, proven to be very useful. And uh, it has clearly helped to have a more stable macroeconomic uh, outlook. But some of the challenges are that at a time of stress and acute uh, global risk aversion, you may face a significant outflow of resources. And actually, um, after the pandemic uh, materialized as a global threat in March, we faced a very sharp contraction of um, foreigners' holdings of government securities, and something that we have not seen uh, in that scales and dynamic uh, for a very long time. And I think that uh, basically conveys the message that there are a lot of benefits for integrating in terms of trade, in terms of financial flows, but you have to be mindful about the challenges that that can entail. And sometimes that obviously may have larger price swings, uh, but at the end of the day, I think uh, we have had an orderly adjustment in the last month. And you might just describe, when you talk about currency volatility over this period, just to explain how volatile was volatile. I just, you might well, just share with that with people. We went from uh, 18.5 pesos for a dollar to over 25 uh, pesos for a dollar uh, from December to March. Uh, so very significant uh, FX uh, depreciation. It has come uh, down uh, to around uh, 21 and a half or so uh, with uh, some volatility in the last uh, days and the last weeks for different reasons. Of course, we are still uh, in the back of the pandemic and, 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 uh, and markets uh, appetite for risk uh, is still quite volatile. Uh, but I think that overall, we have been able to attain one of the key, uh, probably, fears that we had before a floating exchange rate regime. Mexico, and actually we are celebrating this year the 95th anniversary of the central bank, 
uh, literally for all of our history, we had a fixed exchange rate. Uh, having a fixed exchange rate is literally having a, a, a bet that you have sufficient reserves to withstand a fixed exchange rate. And uh, since the tequila crisis in 94 and 95, we were no, no longer able to have a fixed exchange rate. So having a floating exchange rate regime really had the challenge, are we gonna be able to bring inflation down and keep inflation low, even if we don't have a commitment to intervene in the FX market? And I think for, for, for the surprise of many, uh, in the last 25 years, we have been able to consolidate a deep and liquid uh, FX uh, market and uh, low and stable uh, inflation. And I think global confidence, I'll just gratuitously throw this out. I think gr global confidence in the leadership of your bank, of your central bank, I think has been an enormous asset to your country because the challenges, we face challenges a lot in the United States, but the challenges you've faced with currency volatility, uh, uh, trade, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, oil, uh, COVID, uh, I think we're really, uh, you had, I think you had one of the toughest central bank jobs in the world, uh, and you've, you've done it very, very well. And um, uh, I think that explains why you've been able to manage through this, though. Um, le let me ask you, uh, before we get to COVID, talk about NAFTA. What, what, how did it affect you to be able to finally get that issue resolved and sign an updated uh, agreement? Well, let me, let me start saying that uh, I think that NAFTA and, uh, has been uh, a very, a very good uh, instrument to integrate better uh, North America. Uh, I truly believe that uh, the comparative and relative advantages of, of the three countries uh, really point towards uh, having this type of uh, deep integration. Obviously, we had uh, first uh, a very significant challenge, I would say, in all, all, of, all of North America and especially in Mexico, with uh, China's insertion in the WTO. And clearly, uh, with a uh, very similar uh, export uh, basket uh, than Mexico, it was a significant challenge. And uh, nonetheless, I think the, the, the deepening of trade and um, the insertion of uh, Mexico's exports in global value chains and so on uh, are really an example of a success story. Nonetheless, I, I, think, um, I think it's clear that not everything is trade, and you have to be mindful about different things. So I, I understand that there were some questions about other things regarding to the integration, not necessarily only the trade narrative. So that's why probably this uh, uh, revision uh, that ended up in the USMCA uh, came about. I think with the USMCA, we have, first of all, of you, uh, as you mentioned, more clarity, less uncertainty. Of course, that also uh, comes with, uh, with challenges. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, clearly, for example, in the in the auto sector, where, where we have uh, clearly some of these uh, increases uh, uh, in uh, local content that may be challenging. Uh, and we know that if we have uh, a, dyna a, a static response, that means no response, even those restrictions may go against the auto industry in the whole region, in, in the whole North America, but they also entail the opportunity if a dynamic response is engaged in trying to increase uh, that uh, the integration within the region. Uh, but, but it is, again, I think uh, very important that we have uh, attained an upgrade in, in terms of some sectors that were not included uh, before, uh, like e-commerce, uh, more deepening in terms of property rights and things that are very important. And, and I think it shows that it's not only about trade, it's about institutional convergence uh, also some issues regarding labor and some other elements. So, so, so I think some of the upgrade that was included in the USMCA uh, points toward uh, not only trade, but also some convergence about other topics that are relevant. And what do you mean by institutional convergence? Well, in terms of property rights, in terms of uh, these labor uh, elements that were included. So to level the playing field, so to speak. I would say to level the playing field and, and to also highlight that we are more or less to bring about more similarities rather than, uh, than differences. I think where when trade uh, comes about uh, in countries that are very different in other things uh, uh, other than, than trade, 
some things at the end of the day surface and, and that may deteriorate uh, the, the trade relationship. So the more, uh, let's say, uh, similarities about the rest of how E e even socially and, and, and even on, on terms of institutions, property rights, as I said, uh, labor laws, respect for labor laws, and so on, I think uh, the more uh, longer term uh, convergence can be attained. Okay. So we've talked a lot over the last few years about the benefits to the United States of these integrated logistics and supply chain arrangements with Mexico, and to some extent, and lesser extent, but importantly, Canada and how it allowed North America to take share from Asia. Um, now, that the, now that this deal has been settled down, are, are you seen in light of uh, the, the US trade relationship with China, are you seeing more companies look at Mexico as an alternative uh, for supply chains and logistical relationships? Yes, yes we have. And uh, I think it is uh, an opportunity I think uh, that's why I was mentioning uh, why the convergence, it's not only about uh, buying or selling stuff, but also I have a similar approach to other things that are important for both countries. And, um, and I think as we see that divide uh, between uh, the US and, and, and China uh, about a, a whole array of different things, I, I think uh, I, I, if, we, if we take this as an opportunity to bridge some of our strategies to, to bring us closer, I think it's definitely a huge opportunity for North America. I think North America has, for, for, for various reasons, uh, energy, uh, population dynamics, uh, the size of the market, the dynamic of the market, uh, and so on, a huge opportunity to be one of the most competitive regions uh, in the world. And, uh, and probably that uh, can be attained uh, if we uh, try to see how um, companies can divert some of the, let's say, Asian exposure and to reduce some of the Asian exposure and have some of the uh, production closer to, uh, to the US and the, and, and the North American market. So I'm gonna shift, shift gears then to COVID. And uh, we've talked a lot through this. And I know, uh, obviously we have our self-criticisms here in the United States on managing the virus but I know the virus has been very challenging for Mexico. So you might just talk about that. And you haven't had the capacity for the size fiscal response that we've been able to bring to bear here. So you might just talk about how, how you've experienced the virus and what are some of the implications that you've seen. I, I think first that uh, it has been very challenging, uh, not only because uh, how it easy is to get contagion, uh, to, get, uh, to get the disease, uh, I think so it, it has, especially in countries like Mexico, where uh, the informal sector has uh, such a large share, it is very hard uh, to say uh, to the population to confine or to basically uh, uh, be at home. So, so people have to uh, get out and uh, make a living. So it's very hard to, to have these strict uh, confinement uh, restrictions and, and for them to be followed. And I think this is something that it is common in Latin America. As you can see by the dynamic of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic, even in countries that had a longer uh, period of confinement or even a more strict uh, period of confinement, they have not been able to really uh, have a, a significant inflection point uh, downwards in terms of contagion and, and deaths. So uh, it has been really uh, unfortunate that these highly contagious disease uh, has, uh, has come to, to materialize, in, given that we have this informal sector and these, uh, we, we have large urban uh, cities where the density is quite high. So it's, all, it's also very complicated to bring back, bring down the, the contagion. So that has been, uh, that has had a human uh, toll, uh, which has been uh, very high. Uh, in terms of the economic effect, we have seen that this has a challenge in terms of disrupting the supply side of, uh, and production and also the demand side, as we have households and companies that would reduce a, a reduction in their sources of, uh, of income. And obviously uh, in more, uh, I would say advanced and uh, economies with more um, financial resources, they have been able to put aggressive uh, and front loaded uh, fiscal packages basically to try to uh, compensate and reduce uh, job losses 
and to increase disposable income for households to basically uh, have a counter-cyclical type of effect on the, economic, uh, on the economy. In emerging markets, what we have seen, it's not only a rapid contagion and challenges uh, on the, from the health and, and human dimension, but also a reduction in uh, public sector revenues coming from the reduction uh, uh, in the economy and even from commodity prices, which obviously uh, went south uh, when these uh, materialized. So uh, a reduced fiscal space from an already challenging uh, environment ha has made thing, uh, things harder. Of course, you can always debate what's the right uh, uh, and, the, and the room to maneuver that you have. And that has been highly debated in Mexico. We have been of the view that uh, we need to have uh, sustainability in the fiscal accounts. And if you want to spend more, you should find uh, uh, additional sources of revenue, even if they are not for this year or the next, but sustainable sources of revenue to compensate uh, from that, uh, to that additional expenditure. That has not uh, been uh, done in a, in a significant fashion in Mexico, and that is making uh, the business cycle uh, more acute and more pronounced. So you might just give your forecast for 2020, we were talking about earlier today, your forecast for GDP in Mexico for 2020 and then 2021. Well, we have uh, three scenarios and, and those three scenarios are, have depict different paths for the recovery. In the most, uh, with the most recent numbers uh, on, on July, June and July, uh, probably the V-shaped recovery in the short term uh, is expected to, to materialize which is uh, a, a contraction for this year of around 8.8%. The other two scenarios a little bit larger than that, even all the way up to 12% in a, in a very adverse uh, downturn. And the recovery phase, uh, it is around 5.6% 5 5 for next year, in the most benign scenario, and, a little, uh, and lower than that, depending on the, the pandemic uh, dynamic. So it's just, very uncertain. And for the audience, and we were talking about this today, the United States, uh, we think that the contraction will be two and a half to three percent. But a lot of that is a is is the difference between fiscal responses. But again, eight point eight percent this year, but positive five and a half next year. So we think we're going to grow at about three and a half percent in the United States next year. So you'll you'll catch you, you know there'll be some catch up. What would, what's your unemployment rate estimate for end of this year and then next year? We don't, we don't have a, an explicit uh, forecast for, for, for unemployment. Clearly, we have, we have seen it uh, on the rise. And uh, we have lost uh, over a million jobs in the formal sector and, uh, and a very large number of informal, uh, uh, not formal jobs, but uh, people that are occupied in the informal sector. Uh, also, several million have lost that uh, around five. And you might define just for people formal versus informal, how you use those terms. Well, if, if you are uh, basically in a job that offers you uh, social security, that is uh, the formal employment. Informal, it's basically either in a, in a local or family business uh, without any type of uh, social uh, security uh, whatsoever. And heavily service sector, I assume. Yes, yes. So that's been one of the big challenges. Uh, that you were referring to. It's the nature of job you have to, person-to-person -person contact is unavoidable, I gather. It, it, it has been, I think, uh, one of the key elements that have characterized this uh, downturn has been a uh, sharp contrast within, for example, in manufacturing and uh, as the U.S. opened up and some of our also uh, manufacturing uh, plants opened up, uh, the production recovered quite rapidly from the uh, production and the supply side. From the demand side and in some services, uh, it is a completely different story. We have a lot of services, for example, as you know, uh, tourism is very important in Mexico, and uh, tourism is clearly one of the sectors that is going to suffer the most and probably is going to have the most permanent or persistent uh, changes uh, as we move along. So, so the challenges in, and the asymmetries uh, in different sectors are, are going to be substantial, and also the cost of uh, the adjustment uh, in some sectors, and I would say in the in the whole labor force, are very significant. And people might find it interesting to know how are you handling schools in person versus remote, and have there been any impediments uh, availability of Wi-Fi to doing remote schooling? Actually, all schools right now are uh, basically uh, at home, 
there, there has been uh, no uh, major uh, going back to school uh, uh, approach, neither in private schools or public schools. Uh, private schools basically uh, are being uh, done through uh, WebEx uh, and, and uh, as we are talking right now. And for public schools also some special uh, TV channels with classes for uh, the, the whole population were put in place. So that even if you don't have uh, a laptop and you don't have uh, uh, internet, you can have uh, the classes uh, at your home uh, uh, according to the specific needs and, 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 uh, and elements that you require. So as head of the central bank, uh, you might just remind people the setting of, the, of your equivalent to our Fed funds rate right now is? 4.25%. And that is uh, 400 basis points lower than what we had in August last year, which we were coming precisely of that increase in inflation and so on. Uh, so we have come a, a long way from, from what we had a year ago, uh, but it's still uh, in relative terms and compared to other countries, uh, uh, still at a, a level relatively high. And what's your expectations for the outlook uh, for monetary policy? Because obviously in your country, probably even a greater weight for the recovery is on your shoulders than other parts of the, because uh, you don't have as much fiscal latitude. So how do you think about uh, monetary policy from here? Well, uh, we have, and uh, probably it's good to talk about uh, the different dynamics of inflation that we have had in the last months. Uh, after get, reaching a very low level of 2.15% in April, it has come up uh, to 4.1% uh, in the first uh, two weeks of September. And that is basically because of this increase in food prices and the reduction in services ha has not been sufficient to compensate for the increase, uh, mainly in food prices and other merchandises. So, so we have had, uh, let's say, a positive inflation gap and an increasing uh, positive inflation gap. So that has been one of the elements that we have, we need to be mindful. Uh, even though we expect this uh, uh, increase in inflation to be transitory, and we expect uh, from 12 to 24 months ahead uh, inflation, our forecast is around 3%, both for core and uh, overall CPI. Uh, we, we do have to be mindful of the different shocks that we are facing. And uh, so as, as we go along, we're gonna be highly data dependent. We are an inflation targeting uh, central bank. So we are basically focused our policy uh, according to our revisions to uh, our inflation forecasts. And, and in that regard, uh, if the incoming data, both uh, of observed inflation and from the different factors that uh, influence our forecast uh, point towards uh, upwards or downwards, that will be uh, one of the key issues that we will follow and, and play, uh, pay a close attention to. And do you ever face pressure in your country, despite these inflation concerns, to lower the Fed funds rate in order to stimulate the economy more in light of what's going on? There are always uh, ple pressures coming from, from, from every side uh, and, and, and more today. Uh, I think the fact that the economy is contracting in such a severe way and the fact that we have not, for different reasons, uh, uh, let's say a, a significant stimulus pa fiscal package has not been put forward, that increases obviously uh, the tension and the cost for the economy uh, as a whole. But I think we need to be also mindful. Uh, we talked about capital outflows a few minutes ago and how uh, volatile this environment has been. So at the end of the day, uh, we have to ensure that uh, the market adjustment is, uh, takes place in an orderly fashion so that also the economy can adjust in an orderly fashion. Uh, I think we have come a long way, uh, but we have uh, uh, reduced real rates in a significant way. Uh, the majority of uh, central banks today face uh, negative uh, inflation uh, gaps and not positive. So uh, if inflation come back, uh, co comes down uh, faster, that will definitely uh, give us some uh, additional room. Okay, so let me stop there and I'm gonna turn to Mark when we're gonna take questions from the audience. Okay, and just a reminder, if you'd like to ask your question live, just raise your hand and we'll put you in the queue. Uh, first question from the uh, submitted questions, uh, the Bank of Mexico offered a uh, series of liquidity programs in May, in, back in May, that were focused on supporting small businesses.
but these programs do not seem to have been used by banks. Uh, what are the major impediments to allowing small businesses to, to take advantage of these programs? Is it local, civil, local laws, financial regulation, monopolistic practices by banks or something else? Yeah, very good. Uh, yes, we have put uh, an aggressive uh, liquidity package uh, of uh, up to 3.3 percentage points of GDP. I would say that uh, this is basically liquidity, uh, not uh, to be confused with uh, asset purchase programs or QE. Uh, so this is basically a type of liquidity so that financial markets work well and uh, there is not a dash for cash. And we have these cr uh, credit crunch that could come from uh, an acute stress uh, episode. And we offered uh, different uh, instances that go from the wholesale market all the way up to uh, medium and small enterprises and including households. And probably the, the one uh, allocated to households and medium, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises has not been fully used and has not been uh, that uh, influential, influential, probably because you need a combination for these to work. And, I, and the, I think the example in the US is very clear. You need liquidity that usually comes from the central bank but you need uh, loan guarantees or the loss absorption that comes from the treasury. And in the case of Mexico, that comes from uh, guarantees offered by development banks. And development banks have offered some of those uh, programs, some of those uh, resources, but probably not large enough. And, and in that regard, uh, I think that is one of the key reasons why uh, that liquidity uh, has not been uh, used as uh, it could have been expected. Okay, uh, another question actually from one of my colleagues. Do you have any concerns about the stability of Mexico's banking sector during the pandemic and what measures might be needed to mitigate these concerns? We have uh, published uh, since the pandemic started, we have published uh, our own uh, financial stability report. We, we produced uh, two every year. And there is also a stability report that was published last week uh, by uh, the, the Financial Stability Council that basically incorporates the Ministry of Finance and all of the supervisors. And uh, what we have basically stated is in terms of the banking system is that the banking system has a high level of capital and ample liquidity. So it basically entered these uh, crises with, uh, in a position of strength. And uh, nonetheless, we know that it is a very challenging environment and it's gonna be more challenging because these, uh, let's say, counter-cyclical fiscal package have not necessarily been put in place, and that will make uh, things rougher for uh, both uh, companies and uh, household in terms of uh, keeping their, their loans uh, uh, due. Uh, so so this, is, this is obviously going to be uh, an element that we are uh, monitoring. We have been uh, trying to induce a restructuring or refinancing that basically can in increase the probability of the payments uh, being uh, paid in full. Uh, let's see how that uh, turns out. But uh, so far, uh, it is uh, high levels of uh, capital and ample levels of liquidity that are uh, what characterizes the institutions. Uh, next up, uh, we have a live question uh, from an audience member, Jason Later. Uh, Jason, uh, unmute and ask your question, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, you were talking about inflation. I guess you mentioned uh, food, merchandise, and my guess is uh, the falling pace has probably been an impact as well on inflation. Uh, going forward, what do you see as kind of headwinds and tailwinds over the short and intermediate term for inflation? Yes, uh, I would say that it has been uh, clearly this increase in food prices for both uh, supply side reasons, let's say logistic uh, increases in costs and so on. And also because households have allocated a larger share of their uh, resources into food, uh, uh, given, given this, the dynamic we're in. Obviously, the exchange rate has also played a role in some of these uh, uh, merchandise uh, inflation. As we go forward, we expect that these supply side shocks uh, will abate. Uh, we're already seeing uh, when, when you take the monthly variation of uh, uh, without uh, seasonally adjusted data. Uh, in the most recent numbers, we're getting less uh, evidence of an ongoing shock. So 
we expect that the most significant part of the price adjustment has already taken place. Of course, this can change if we have an additional round of uh, uncertainty and an increase in, in, in prices. But we do expect this to be transitory and the demand side uh, downward pressures on inflation to basically dominate uh, as we go forward. But this is, uh, again, our, our best outlook. Uh, we hope that, uh, material, that materializes. And I gather uh, businesses have managed to, uh, they've had enough time to manage around these supply shocks is what you're saying, and are finding ways to get additional supply. Yes, and, uh, and also adjust to, to a more expensive, they have uh, to distance, they have less people at the, at, the, at the production facilities and so on. So all of those items probably have, have now been uh, absorbed and we don't expect a recurrence uh, of uh, the increases in prices coming from that, from that sort. Uh, are the soccer teams playing, by the way? Foot, I guess football, you would call it in Mexico, are they playing? They are, they are. It's amazing how, how the sports industry has been resilient and, and we are all having, uh, uh, we're all at home and the only entertainment that we get are, is from sports. So both from uh, soccer here in Mexico and uh, I, I know that the NBA in the US uh, have yeah. managed to have this bubble uh, and, and now even uh, the NFL with some challenging uh, uh, COVID uh, cases. But uh, I, I think uh, as, as, as people say, uh, the show must go on. Okay, good. Okay, we have another live question from an audience member, Pedro Morera. Uh, Pedro, unmute your microphone and ask your question, please. Pedro? I guess we have, we don't have Pedro. Okay, um, another live question from uh, Sean Corcoran. Sean, if you uh, unmute your microphone, you can ask your question. Hi, yes, thanks very much. Um, Governor diaz alone you mentioned that if inflation starts to move down a bit faster, there could be additional room for another cut. Uh, given that the central bank expects inflation to start coming down from this point on, averaging 3.7% in the last quarter. Do you think that that will be sufficient for maybe an additional room to ease? Well, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, if uh, we get either from the dynamic of inflation or some of the factors that are uh, critical for our inflation forecast, if we see less pressures and if we see uh, prices uh, coming down, well, that, that will give us more room to maneuver. Uh, if we don't, uh, that, then that, that will be a different story. And, and I think the key element, and that's why since uh, the first quarter of 2018, we published our numeric inflation forecast, is that uh, we can gauge this in a more clear and transparent way. So uh, right now we have our forecast there. Uh, if we see uh, dynamics that will push that uh, our revised forecast downwards in a sharp way, well, that, of course, will be something um, that the board will consider in our monetary uh, policy decisions. In contrast with uh, other central banks and mainly in advanced economies, we have uh, found that uh, providing little guidance has been very useful because we have been in very volatile and challenging times. And uh, we, have, uh, we are in a different uh, position and in a different situation. So uh, providing clarity about our reaction function and not necessarily about our monetary actions have, uh, I think, worked well for Mexico in the last uh, years. And uh, we expect to keep uh, that way. You, you, you mentioned the board, so it's a good opportunity to comment. Explain the, the structure of your decision making. How often does the board meet? Uh, how does the how does the governance work? Well, we have uh, actually daily meetings uh, for market updates, for ongoing decisions, uh, for the different communiques on, on data surveys that we published. Uh, we uh, have monetary policy decisions every eight weeks. Uh, we have uh, deep uh, briefings from the staff. We uh, announce our decisions on, on Thursdays, and two weeks later, we provide uh, a detailed minutes of uh, the discussions and the statements uh, that the five uh, members of the board uh, have and provide. And actually we're gonna be published, we will publish after three years, 
the full statements of uh, each uh, member of the of the board, which I think is one of the shortest uh, time spans uh, for uh, yeah. publishing these statements. Similar to the Fed, but yes. And and if you, how often do you get a dissent among the five? It's 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 often uh, it often happens. I, I would say that when you have clarity about the trend, probably you have more convergence. Where when you are getting into inflection points, either on the upward or on the downward phase of the interest rate cycle, uh, probably you, you start getting more dissent because people see different trade-offs and are gauging trade-offs in, in, in a different way. So, so that's why uh, I, I think that uh, in those inflection points, it's where, where it's more, more likely to have uh, these uh, dissent uh, views. And, and I've asked you this question before, including as recently as this morning, but I think it's very interesting to hear your answer. How does it affect your job and the challenges of your job for the Fed to be keeping rates at uh, basically the, the, the lower bound, uh, zero to 25? Does it make it easier, harder? And the fact that it looks like we're going to stay here for some period of time, how does that affect, how does it affect you? I think always uh, what we consider uh, the risk-free asset uh, for of the world and of the region, uh, the relevant world for us and for the region, uh, I think it is always very important. And when we had the uh, Fed increases in rates a few years ago, it was definitely a concern and a consideration. We're starting to see uh, portfolios being adjusted and influencing pricing uh, at the margin and so on. So it's definitely a, an element to keep, uh, to keep a, a very close eye on. And in terms of this lower for longer, clearly reduces the pressure and the tension uh, in the rest of the world. That doesn't mean that that will be the, the dominant driver of things in emerging markets or in Mexico, because we have other elements at play. At play. We have idiosyncratic elements, uncertainties, and also these concerns about uh, the dynamics in GDP growth and fiscal policy uh, in, in, in the emerging uh, market world. And just to explain this to people, uh, the reason this is a factor is if our rates were higher, so where people think I can be in dollars and the spread between your rate and our rate narrows, your concern is, or, or in, in emerging markets generally, that it would, it might encourage more people to move to dollars and you'd have currency uh, uh, fluctuations. Yes, and, and, and that's why it's, it's important. I would say the, the long-term neutral rate of interest and also the short-term uh, uh, rate uh, in the US, uh, both are relevant. And obviously with all of the discussion about the revision of uh, neutral rates uh, going, going south, that, that also has implications for the neutral rates in emerging markets. And it may, they may well be also going uh, south for that consideration. But nonetheless, given the pandemic, what we have seen is that CDS and risk premia has gone up. So uh, the risk-free asset is going down, but risk premia is going up. So uh, it depends on what dominates and at different points in time. Maybe at the beginning, uh, the risk premia is very, is very large. And as things start to settle down, we will have uh, the, the lower US rates dominating in the uh, asset pricing uh, dynamic. Okay, back to you, Mark. Okay, we have another audience member who'd like to ask a question. Hector Paras, uh, if you unmute, you should be able to ask your question. Hector? Thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, well, I have two, well, it will be just one because you just answered the one about the rates. Uh, is there any political tensions between a central bank and, and, and the president about the, the remnants of, of the central bank? And are they going to be handed to the public ascendary the next year, like the law it, it says it should be, be done? Just to put uh, the question in perspective, um, in, in, throughout the year, uh, it has been a question that has been raised uh, since March. Uh, we have by law to basically give back the surplus of the central bank uh, has to be uh, handed up to the federal government. Even though we, have, we are uh, an autonomous central bank uh, for, for over 25 years, are, as part of the law, it is, it is very clear that if for whatever reason we have a surplus that basically compensates for our uh, needed capital, needed reserves, and so on, if after everything is all checked, there is a surplus, 
that has to be handed out to the uh, federal government. And um, since we have an exchange rate that has depreciated and we basically have a very long position in dollars and uh, uh, we finance that in pesos, uh, sustainable uh, exchange rate depreciations may increase that surplus. So it always uh, raises the question of what's gonna happen with that number, what's the size of that number. Uh, and I think this is always uh, uh, something that uh, raises um, uh, attention, but I, I would say that the law is very clear. And actually I had a, a meeting with the president in March and we actually talked about this uh, because there, there was a probably lack of clarity of the timing of this. And first the year has to come to an end. Then you have to see what was the operating surplus for the year. Then you have to look at the losses, the accumulated losses that you have in the balance sheet, which we have. Then you have to say what's the desired level uh, of, uh, of capital, which is determined by law. And then uh, this, the, the reserves for the volatility that you may face going forward. And then if there is a surplus, we have to hand this to the federal government uh, basically uh, in April. And this is still an ongoing element. We don't know how the year is going to end and we don't know what, what, uh, what the, the number will be. But rest assured, as, as, we, as I told the president uh, at, that, uh, at that meeting, that we will follow uh, step by step what it is stated uh, on, on the law. And if there is a, a surplus, it will be handed uh, to the government. And if it's not, there is not a surplus, then uh, nothing, uh, uh, th there will be nothing to hand out. Uh, next in line, Christina Bringas. Christina, if you unmute, you can ask your question. Governor, um, thank you for your time. I represent a border town, El Paso, Texas, and when it comes to trade, El Paso surpassed pre-pandemic levels in June. Um, and so it's been said that there's a indication that this could be signs of a V-shaped recovery. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I would say what we have seen in the data is that for some sectors, uh, there has been a rapid recovery and an inflection point, a strong rebound. And probably we're going to see two types of relevant uh, phases. The first is in the very short term, we, some sectors that were uh, shut down and they are opening, they can have a, a rapid recovery. But for other sectors, uh, the effects uh, and the costs associated to the pandemic are going to last for longer. Uh, and that, that may be, will be uh, quite challenging. So I think we're going to have uh, asymmetries or uh, more heterogeneous responses according to sectors. And uh, probably in some uh, export activities, you may get this sharp recovery. Depends on, 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 the, on the type of products uh, being uh, exported. But in others like uh, services, and uh, as we talked before, face-to-face -face, uh, services, uh, that is suffering uh, dearly. And, and, and that is going to take longer. So. There is, I think, more uncertainty on the medium term phase of the recovery, and especially also because we don't have a, a sufficient or a significant uh, stimulus that has been given to Mexican households or consumers. Of course, we are benefiting from so, for some of the uh, support that was given in the US and that has uh, uh, induced a recovery in some sectors, but um, still it's going to be asymmetric and with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, next, uh, a question from the queue, actually. Uh, in the United States, we seem to be unable to hit a 2% inflation target from below. Observing from Mexico, what do you make of that? <laughs> well, I, I would say the following, and, and it's been very, very curious. Um, when when we, didn't, we have inflation expectations north of our target, our target is 3%. Our long-term inflation expectations are around 3.5%. And we used to get the question, well, that's because there is not sufficient credibility and so on. And now going to the advanced economies world, you have the 2% inflation and you have long-term inflation expectations south of that. And then the question is, is there insufficient credibility on the central bank and so on? I think that it is not really a function of credibility only. It is also a function about past data. Any forecaster is gonna have a hard time uh, uh, expecting a number that has not been in the data sample for quite some time. And they're gonna be 
in, in that, in that the dimension, they're going to be mean reverting. What has been the mean, the absurd mean? Well, that's going to have a lot of influence on my forecast. So uh, unless we attain and, and, and maintain inflation around the target for a, for, for a sufficient period of time, expectations are going to be basically where inflation has been, not where we would like it to be. And that points towards a different type of challenge. And, and in the case of Mexico, we have been probably more prone uh, to shocks that have put upward pressures of pressures on prices. And uh, I think in the case of advanced economies, you have been more prone to shocks that have put, put downward pressures on prices. So it's also conditional on the type of shocks that you face. If, if everything would be without shocks, we will converge immediately to our, towards our target. But in a world with sufficient shocks, I think that the shocks have a lot to say about where inflation has been and where inflation expectations are more or less uh, anchored, even if that doesn't make us happy because it's not in our targets. So Alejandro, one question. We talk a lot here about technology, technology-enabled disruption, and the acceleration due to COVID of, of, of this trend and limiting the pricing power. Is it possible that it's, that it's due to structural changes that are overwhelming the cyclical forces and uh, maybe even more powerful than monetary policy? I think you can make the case that that uh, may well be happening. I think that probably it has been more uh, a fight for market share in the global marketplace, uh, the dominant factor, and literally taking advantage of technology and uh, technological change and innovation, basically to feed into that market share uh, uh, dynamic. And that has been very positive for the consumer, but has, that has implied more fragility for the aggregate demand dynamic and for price formation in general. So, so I think it has created this loop where it seems almost impossible to uh, have the aggregate demand dynamic that could have inflation, inflation going up. And, uh, I, and I think it's hard to tell when this will end or not or, or how uh, this would uh, uh, look uh, going forward. It, it's really uncharted territory on, some, on, on so many fronts that it is hard to anticipate what will happen. Mark, let's take one more. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, one more live question from the queue, Martin Mesquita. Martin, uh, if you unmute, you can ask your question. Thank you, Governor, for your time. Uh, my question is, if inflation comes back to target, uh, do you see speech for negative real rates in Mexico? Thank you. I, I think um, we, we don't have, uh, I would say, any type of uh, uh, restriction or perception that uh, real rates should be always above or below X amount of uh, uh, a particular number. I think that the, the question is, at the end of the day, if our inflation dynamics and the output gap dynamics point towards uh, a more accommodative stance that uh, may well be even in the real rate in negative territory, that may well happen. Uh, but I, I, again, that will be a function of the type of shocks that we have uh, both in the real economy, which are very clear right now, and on inflation. If we would have the negative inflation gap that uh, a lot of, that many countries have uh, today, well, clearly will, rates uh, should be uh, much lower than where, where they are today. But that, that, that is obviously conditional on the dynamics of inflation. So let me ask one final question uh, as, uh, t as time is coming to a close. You've been uh, a public servant and in the public sector and a great leader, I would add, in Mexico for many years. Why is public service important to you? Well, um, I think public service has been very interesting uh, because probably um, one element that has, uh, for me, it is very interesting is, is to try to understand uh, problems and economic problems and try to change them uh, for the better. And um, I think if you have, uh, if you're in a public service uh, responsibility, the scope and the impact of that is, is larger. And I would even say that in emerging markets where institutional institutions in general as are less mature, also the scope to add value 
in that dimension is larger. So at the end of the day, it's, it's um, I think we all like to add value and you can add value in the private sector or in the public sector. And probably the scope of how much value you can add and how much you can change, it's larger on the public sector than on the private sector. And um, I think uh, on, uh, on the, the challenge or, or, or the key issue is try to understand uh, the complex environment where we are and try to see you, how you can change things for the better. Governor Diaz de Leon, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, on behalf of the Dallas Fed and everyone involved here, we look forward to continue to build our relationship with you and with the Central Bank of Mexico. And uh, I think it's it's been a great relationship for many years and we look forward to working with you for many years to come. Thank you again. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mark. I've enjoyed this a lot. And uh, I hope that we continue to have this strong relationship with the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Thank you. Thank you.